Hello everyone, welcome back to Global Topics in English D2. This is our week 5. In weeks 5 and 6, this course will focus on one of the most important aspects of filmmaking, continuity editing. Today's content may sound too theoretical, but you should be able to understand it through the discussion in chapter 6 of the textbook. Editing refers literally to how shots are put together to make up a film. As viewers, we are trained to watch films without paying attention to how they are constructed or how each shot is connected to another. Traditionally, a film is made up of sequences or successive shots that are assembled in what is known as collision editing or montage. At its simplest, there are four categories of editing, continuity editing, cross-cutting or parallel editing, deep focus, and montage. A film can be constructed entirely using one category out of these four categories. Generally speaking, however, filmmakers tend to use two, if not all, categories. Each category has different implications in terms of temporal relations. Time can seem long or short. Time can have an interior or an exterior reality. Interior temporality is suggested by the sequence and is fictional. Exterior temporality occurs when there is a direct correspondence between sequence time and time within the narrative. Again, generally speaking, a film will use both kinds of temporality. In this video, we are going to focus on continuity editing and what consists of it. As the term implies, this type of editing follows the logic of chronological narrative. One event follows naturally on from another, Time and space are therefore logically and unproblematically unproble uh, represented. Beginnings and endings of sequence are clearly demarcated. Shots throughout the sequence orientate the spectator in time and space, and the end of a sequence safely indicates where and when the narrative will get picked up in the following sequence. This is a strategy in film practice that ensures narrative continuity. The film does not draw attention to the ways in which the story gets told. The editing is invisible and as such offers a seamless, spatially and temporally cohesive narrative. Spatial continuity is maintained by strict adherence to the 180 degree rule. Temporal continuity by observing the chronology of the narrative. 180 degree rule is also known as the imaginary line. This is a rule that ensures consistency of the spectator's perspective. Essentially, when shooting a scene, cameras should stay on one side of this imaginary line and otherwise the spectator will, would get disoriented as the diagram illustrates. The three cameras are on one side of the line pointed at the object on the line. As the film unra unravels on screen, the spectator takes up any of those three cameras uh, cam three camera positions depending on which shot position has been chosen at any given time and edited into the final cut. There is perfect logic in this per perspectival gaze for the spectator. For instance, uh, please take a look at this slide. Uh, these two shots are from Todd Haynes, uh, Todd Haynes 2015 film Carol in which two characters, Carol and Therese, are having a meal together at the dining. The camera places one character in the center on, of the frame in one shot, and then the next shot does the same to the, to the other character. 
After shooting these shots separately using two cameras positioned at different places, filmmakers edit different shots together to create a flow or otherwise a sense of continuity. But what is a camera when the other side of the line? Oh, oh sorry. But what if the camera uh, went to the other side of the line? Uh, the spectator's perspective would be reversed. They would be seeing things back to back to front. If the object was two uh, two characters in a conversation, uh, their position would be reversed. Character A would be in character B's position. Then. Uh, then the 180 degree rule would be broken, causing disorientation. Continuity editing is the one most readily associated with classical Hollywood cinema and is one uh, which produces a very linear text. This, linear, this linearity or chronological order gets broken Sorry, uh, broken only when there is a flashback or a cross cutting to a parallel sequence. In both instances, however, uh, this break with linearity is signaled. For example, a fade or dissolve with a voiceover is used to signify that a flashback is coming. A quick series of cuts between two different locals at the beginning of a parallel sequence to link them up logically for the spectator. However, uh, film theoreticians have made the point, uh, point that this seamlessness masks the labor that goes into manufacturing uh, the film and as such has an ideological effect. This cinema gives the spectator the impression that the reality uh, presents as natural uh, what is in fact an idealistic reality. The spectator has a sense of unitarity, uni oh, sorry, unitary vision over, uh, over which characters believe they have supremacy. In this respect, the spectator colludes with the idealism of the cinematic reality effect seamlessly. Seamlessness is a key effect of continuity editing and is used to refer to the Hollywood film style where, in the name of realism, the editing does not draw attention to itself. The spectator is presented with a narrative that is edited in such a way that it appears to have no breaks, no disconcerting, unexplained transitions in time and space, hence its seamlessness. It is the opposite of an editing style that draws attention to itself, mostly found in oppositional, non-mainstream, and counter cinema uh, that we are not going to uh, talk about today. In order to understand the structure of uh, seamlessness, the rest of this lecture will focus on the following three aspects apparatus, spectatorship, and spatial and temporal contiguity. As a term, apparatus refers to the technology of the camera and film projector. As a theoretical concept, it refers to the effects of this ten technology upon the spectator. According to Baudry, the cinematic apparatus or technology has an ideological effect upon the spectator. In the simplest instance, the cinematic apparatus purports to set before the eye and ear realistic images and sounds. However, the technology disguises how, the, how that uh, reality is put together uh, frame by frame. It also provides the illusion of pers perspectival space. This double illusion conceals the work that goes into the production of meaning and, in so doing, presents as natural uh, what in fact is an ideological construction that is an idealistic reality. In this respect, uh, Baudley argues the spectator is positioned as an all-knowing subject because they are all seeing 
even though they are unaware of the process whereby they become fixed as such. Thus, the omniscient spectator subject is produced by is the effect of the filmic text. A contiguous, simultaneous ideological effect occurs as a result of the way in which the spectator is positioned within a theater, in a darkened room, the eyes projecting towards the screen with the projection of the film coming from behind that head. Because of this positioning, an identification occurs with the camera. The spectator is engaged in an exchange by the filmic text, the film thereby constructs the subject. The subject is an effect of the filmic text. Thus, the spectator as subject is constructed by the, by the meaning of the filmic text. In everyday usage, spectatorship refers to the state of being present at and looking at and a show or a spectacle. In film studies, it points to the activity or condition of viewing a film. While the term spectatorship is quite commonly used in its everyday sense in film studies, it has more precise meanings in those areas of film, they, uh, film theory that uh, deal with uh, the operations at work in our engagement with and comprehension of the sights and sounds that make up the cinematic experience. Spectatorship plays a key role in the cinematic apparatus. Spectatorship theory has gone through four stages to date. In stage one, in the early to mid-1970s, the issues of spectatorship was first addressed theoretically as a result of the impact of semiotics, kigogaku, and psychoanalysis, seishin bunseki, on, the on film theory. Baudry, Belor, and Metz wrote about cinema as an apparatus and ima imaginary signifier to explain what happened to the spectator as they sat in a darkened theater gazing onto the screen. The relationship between cinema and the unconscious is not a new concept, however. Cinema as a mediator for unconscious desire, the suitability of the screen as a projection site for the inner workings of the psyche had been discussed by the uh, earlier theorists in the 1920s and 1930s as well as had the uh, similitude between the mechanisms of dreams and unconsciousness to those of film. But it was not until the 1970s that full consideration was given to the effect of the cinematic experience upon the spectator. In stage two, post-1975, feminist film theory, the natural assumption implicit in those first writings that masculine was the place from which the spectator looks and natural acceptance that each viewing was unproblematic reenactment of the edible trajectory were strongly contested by the critique and filmmaker Laura Marvey. In stage 3, 1980s, mostly feminist film theory, Marvey's writings provoked further investigations by theorists who thought to widen the debate by bringing in uh, theoretical approaches other than psychoanalysis. Stage 4, after 1990s, uh, audience reception, also known as reception theory, was arguably a natural outcome of the preceding approaches and is one, uh, is one that still prevails today. I'm not going to explain these four stages in more detail uh, here today, but I recommend uh, these two books if you are interested in uh, film theory. Within classic narrative cinema, space and time are coherently represented in order to achieve the reality effect. Shots reveal spatial relationship between characters 
and objects as such implicate the views as specta spectating subject. That is, shots are organized in a, in a specific, specific way so that the spectator can make sense of what they see. The way in which space is carved up within a shot, size and volume of objects or characters, also provide meaning. Equally, uh, given that mainstream classic cinema assumes an unfolding of the traditional narrative of order, disorder, order restored, time is implicitly chronological and so must be seen to run contiguously with space. Art cinema has disrupted this notion of temporal and spatial continuity through, for example, jump cuts, unmatched shots, flash forwards, looping images, and so on. Interestingly, mainstream cinema has adopted many of those techniques even though they do not serve the same disruptive function but seem to function more like cinematic jokes which the spectator can enjoy. So to sum up today's lecture, continuity editing is one of the most essential components of filmmaking in general. Audiences are trained to see movies without even being conscious of uh, where editing occurs. It is because filmmakers following the styles of classical Hollywood filmmaking do put lots of efforts to make sure that the story develops seamlessly. In so doing, filmmakers succeed in inviting audiences to engage in the story, namely identifying with the, with the characters. The system of continuity editing is made possible through understanding cinema as art developed by the filmic apparatus that introduced a new style of storytelling in the late 19th century and developed throughout the 20th century. As filmmakers learned to tell a story visually through cinema, they went through various attempts in sophisticating techniques to maintain spatial and temporal linearity through which audiences, or in other words, spectators, are allowed to, deep, to dive deeply into the mind of characters. Next week, we are going to focus on cross-cutting, deep focus, and montage. So please continue to read chapter 6 if you haven't. I am currently reading, uh, reading your film analysis number 1. Uh, I should be able to send them back to you uh, all by next week. And also, the due date of the film analysis number 2 is coming up in two weeks as well. So I'm going to decide which films to have you watch for that hopefully uh, this weekend. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to send me emails or messages. See you next week. Bye-bye.